My name is uh, Jane Hotsinger, and I am the analyst um, that is in charge of um, working out the, the business issues with HMIS. Um, and so I'm actually going to take a, a lead from my, my boss, Steve, over there, Butts. He talked about um, how some things as a company we learn to do better. And um, I'm putting HMIS into that category. Um, for those of you who, uh, or actually, let's see a show of hands. Who is an HMIS user right now? Great. OK, so you all know it was a painful transition when Brian left to um, social solutions turning HMIS over to a team of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, there was, I think, blood on all ends. Yeah. Um, and we acknowledge it. We apologize for it. We've learned from it. And we will come out stronger for it um, in the end. So I, I did want to start off with that. And just to let you know, we do have a team now. So HMIS is not um, uh, segregated down to one person. Um, we have a whole team. So uh, first of all, um, I'm going to uh, introduce my um, partner in crime over here. Uh, this is Chris Napier, and he is um, one of our lead sales representatives for HMIS. Um, I think Peter's in the, Peter's in the room. Um, he is also with sales. Um, Tony, is t Tony, uh, you all know Tony. <laughs> Yay, Tony. I, I, I send him kisses regularly through the, through the mail. Um, Tony is uh, the tier two support. So HMIS has become such an important focus for our company. Um, when you call in to support, um, if it doesn't, um, the, the, the normal support person who takes that call does not have a solution, it gets bumped immediately to tier two, which is Tony. If Tony has problems solving it, it gets bumped to me immediately as tier three. And then if I can't solve it, I'm immediately talking to the developers. Um, with that in mind, um, is Adam in here? And Adam's not in here. Um, Adam is um, one of our directors of development who is working with HMIS. And uh, this gentleman over here, Xander, um, is now uh, our main programming guy who is actually working on our APR right now. So, and, and different reports in the AHAR. So we are thrilled and thrilled and thrilled uh, to have him with us as well. Uh, let's see, anybody else on our team? No, I think that's it. Okay. Um, I, also, Ewan, um, I don't know if you know Ewan in account management. He is also uh, part of the HMIS team. Um, we are going to do a little presentation. Uh, Chris is going to start off um, and talk about um, HMIS. Um, and then I will take over showing you our roadmap. Um, as I said, HMIS is now focus group of the company. So that means over especially the next year and a half, tremendous uh, resources, time, effort are all going in to HMIS. Uh, we are completely 100% determined that we are going to be the best by the time we are done with HMIS. So um, let me just switch, ooh, let me little switch my mic to Chris and we will get started. Understanding is our presentations will be online. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. So for everybody that uh, let me just move this here, for anybody that raised their hand and said they are not using HMIS, I'm going to go through just some quick definitions uh, so that you understand what HMIS is all about. So the first thing, HMIS stands for Homeless Management Information Systems. Uh, let me switch this mic over so you guys can hear me a little better. Uh, homeless management information systems are designed with uh, the understanding that you're going to collect all the data from all of your continuum. Now what is a continuum? A continuum of care is actually a bunch of agencies that work together in a community to be able to handle somebody from any aspect of their homelessness. Uh, a lead agency is then used to uh, be, be the person that will handle the HMIS system. So in a, in a continuum, you have a lead agency. They, they collect the funds. They usually disperse uh, where the funds are going, um, how they're being used, et cetera. 
Uh, and then a COC program is anything that has reference to a particular HMIS program. So for some of you, this is probably uh, old news, right? Okay, I got some head shakes. Is this new to anyone? Okay, well, all right. Uh, a couple things, APR, we brought that up. That's the uh, annual performance report. As you know, that's the most important thing you do in HMIS is, pre is present that to the government. If you can't do that, you can't get your funds. So uh, obviously helping the homeless is probably the most important, but this is the second most important thing we can do. Now the QPR, does anybody here do HPRP as well? Okay. So you understand that the, the QPR is very important to HPRP. Now HPRP doesn't necessarily have to run through uh, HMIS at this point in time, but it will in the future. Um, the nice thing about the HPRP is uh, when those funds came out and were available, you could actually go out and get some of these systems. So a lot of people were able to get systems that didn't have them previously, and they're able to use those. Now the AHAR. Uh, that is something that we use to present to Congress so that they can say, here's, here's the story that we have on homelessness. Uh, so you're probably familiar with that. Uh, what you may not be familiar with is CSV files in HUD XML. What that allows us to do is send data back and forth between HMIS systems. Uh, and that's something that the government came out with, which was actually kind of revolutionary, uh, at least in this space, which allows us to send information between two different systems uh, regardless of what system you're using, you can actually use it, you should be able to use that data between the, the different systems. Has anybody run into problems with that yet? Yeah. Uh, the standard is there, that doesn't mean it necessarily is followed by all vendors. Go ahead. So a little bit about the structure. So the COC is where all the money flows into. Uh, then you have the lead agency. The lead agency will then send that out to the different programs. Now, one thing that should be noticed here is we have all the programs here, but there's different services. Now, not all of those services may be related to HMIS. So, uh, for instance, if you're a domestic violence shelter, you may have one aspect of what you do is homelessness, but other pieces may not be. And if you're not using it for those other pieces, it has a tendency to uh, be kind of challenging because you have to data enter into multiple systems. Does anybody have to do that now? A little bit of a challenge, right? Uh, anytime you have to put data entry into two different systems, you run into a couple issues. One, you start looking at quality issues. Because if I put it into one system and I type it into the next system, my name, for example, Chris Napier, it's also Christopher Napier. So if I present to one person and I use my full name and I go to the next place and I use a different name, it may not necessarily be the same. Uh, so that can, be, that can be kind of a challenge. Um, if we're all in one system, however, then it makes sense to everybody. Go ahead and go to the next. So a true continuum is a true collaboration. So the two-way referral allows you to send information back and forth between different agencies. For instance, they may come into a, a, a domestic violence shelter and then they need to uh, get, get child care. So you're going to send that person from the domestic violence shelter to a child care shelter. Does that make sense? Now, if, if they come into one and then you send them to the next and you send a referral, you don't necessarily know what happened to that person. You don't necessarily know once they got to the, 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 the daycare that, that that child was seen, what happened, uh, what, what were the outcomes from that. And you can't really track it. So that's something that, uh, that we really have to work on uh, in, a in a true collaboration. So if, if you're working between different organizations and you start to refer back and forth, what happens to your people? A lot of people can't track that. That's something that we can now follow up on because we're in a collaboration. All of that data goes from one agency to the next. The next thing is the, the less data entry. So again, if you're not data entering twice, you're much more likely to have uh, better quality. And as you know, the better the quality, uh, you're actually going to be able to get more money, right? Uh, part of the selection process when you, when you put that out is to be able to get that data quality. The other thing it allows us to do is we put all programs into one system. So if we're all in one system, we can track how that person's doing throughout each of the processes. So that's very important for our people. The other thing, data uh, aggregation. So I say aggregation. Does everybody know what that allows us to do? Pull it across the, the entire, okay. Uh, and, and so I won't get into that. Go ahead and go to the next one. So HEART Act. How much have you guys learned about Hearth Act so far? 
Quite a bit. You feeling uh, comfortable about it? Yeah, most people are. So the Hearth Act, uh, it, it actually was put into place two years ago. So the only thing that's really come out and that, that has impacted us so far with the Hearth Act is the definition of homelessness. As you know, that's changed. Is everybody familiar with that? Okay. So what, what is that going to do to HMIS? A couple things that are going to change. Uh, obviously, the emergency shelter grant or the emergency solution grant, ESG grants, uh, currently those can be tracked in a number of places. Uh, moving forward, however, those all have to go through HMIS. Uh, does anybody do ESG? Is it? Do you guys have that in your uh, uh, three? Does, is that actually in your HMIS now? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Uh, what about any of the homeless prevention, your HPRP? Okay. HMIS. HMIS. Is yours? So you're putting it into two different systems? Okay. So that, that will change. How about veterans programs? Do you guys do anything with that? Not yet. So all veterans programs now also have to go through HMIS. So that's going to make, it's going to cause a lot of people that are into different systems to now have to come up under the COC. Uh, you have a question? Chris, when you say all veterans programs, do you, do you mean um, veterans homeless services or all veterans services, period? Or Just the homeless services. So the VAs actually need to interface now with the COCs, which in the past they didn't have to do. When they handled their veterans uh, and they were homeless, they could go through their own their own processes. That's not the case going forward with the Hearth Act. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next stage. So some of the things about uh, the Hearth Act, as you know, 2009 is when it was, when it was in actually signed into law. Uh, it, it's going to do a couple different things. Uh, excuse me. The, the matching is going to change uh, and the increase in performance. So in the past, you really just had to count. You had to get numbers. You had to show what you were doing, how many homeless people you had, what you were going to, you know, how those people were being put into your system, whether they were in a, a Shelter Plus program or where they were located. In the future, the thing that's going to change quite a bit is that uh, we're actually going to have to show what we're doing. So now you have a, a certain period of time before we have to show that these, these people or these families are now no longer homeless. Does anybody, is, has anybody been familiar with what that change is going to be? So, so now you have a certain period of time before you have to show that these people are no longer homeless. Does, has anybody seen that? So there's a, a time period, it's about 30 days, that you have to show where they're at. And the goal is to get them to a 30 day, they come into your shelter and now they're gone. And that's, that's something that I don't think is going to happen right away. But that's, that's, what, that's what they're shooting for. Uh, and, and that's something that is going to be very difficult for most organizations to be able to track and show the outcomes and to be able to show what they're doing and what kind of recidivism rates they have once they put those people out. Let's go to the next step. Uh, also, changes to your selection criteria. So let's say you're putting in your NOFAs every year or your super NOFA. Some of the things that are going to change going forward if you want to continue to be competitive and to continue to get that funding are these things. And, and that's a big change from the past. In the past, you, you had to show that you were doing the things that you had to do. You're presenting your APR, you're presenting your AHAR. That's changed. So now you have to not only present that information, but you also have to make sure that you can show quantifiable performance measures. You have to show that you've set the timeline for the task and it's going to happen at that point in time. Uh, some other things is what is your strategy to reduce homelessness? Do you, do you have that now, right? Everybody has their 10-year plan and everybody's working towards it. But the question is, can you go out and actually show what you're doing to make that change? Can anybody do that now? And, and that's going to be a big change. So when you actually have to put the Hearth Act into place, a, a lot of what you do now is going to change. Uh, you're going to have to do a lot more measuring of how you're getting that person into the programs. Once they're in the programs, are they achieving the goals that you've set out? And you have to list the goals. The other thing that's going to happen, if you go to the next stage, the next slide, please. Uh, another thing that is going to become very important is this, the incentives for successful implementation. So the better you implement and you have this strategy in place, and, and it's based on what you're telling people that you're able to do, and you're able to get them into these programs, and you're able to show these results, you actually get additional funding. 
Uh, and has anybody noticed that about the Hearth Act? So now you get additional funding for doing what they're asking you to do, which is a little different than the past, which is we'll just give you the money and then you can show us how you're spending it. Now it's the better you implement this, the better you're able to show us what you're doing, the more money you're going to get, which is, we've never seen that before from HUD. What are they, Chris, real quick on that, what are they, what are they, what's the, what are they implementing in the HMIS system? The Hearth Act itself. So, so there's multiple steps. Go back up a slide, would you? So these are the kind of things that we have to implement to, to show that we're going to be compliant with HEARTH. So we have to, to do, we have to collaborate with local education. We have to go and put the overall reduction in the number of homeless individuals and families. These are the pieces that we're measuring that we've never done before through performance. Uh, and the other pieces are, what is your strategy? What are we hitting as far as our, our quantifiable performance goals? And are we hitting those goals? And what is our timeline to show this? And when we can do that, when we can go out and show to uh, HUD, these are the things that we're putting in place to reduce the, the recidivism rate of our homeless when they come back into the shelter. These are the things we put into place and these are the things that we're actually achieving. They actually will provide us with additional funding. So that's kind of a nice step. Uh, as well as uh, all uh, of the HPRP funding will be flowing through there as well. So that's something that uh, if you're trying to be selected or you're in a competitive environment, as you know, uh, a lot of the COCs are being kind of drawn down into, uh, into additional COCs. They're, they're kind of being merged together. Have you guys seen that at all yet? So as they're merging those together, you have to become competitive to be able to retain that funding source that you're getting from the government. And the other thing that, that this allows you to do is uh, you all have a match, right? You have to pull together your match, that 20%. A lot of the things that you're doing for Hearth Act uh, that are going to be listed in here will count towards that match. So that's uh, especially this, this, uh, the extra incentives. So if you don't have to get that, that ex additional 20%, you can use that directly for working in your shelters, uh, directly to your programs rather than putting it towards that match. So that's a pretty good incentive. Any questions on, on Hearth right as I presented it? Are you guys bored with Hearth? <laughs> so quiet. All right. So what does that mean to us? So if you look at some of the uh, systems that are actually on the market today, uh, there, there's kind of a difference. Most of the HMIS systems that have been traditionally developed really have one thing in mind. We're going to count and we're going to present an APR and an AHAR. Beyond that, we're not really going to get too in-depth into case management. Have, has anybody noticed that? Anybody on a previous system? So as we move forward with the Hearth Act coming out and saying, hey, we want to see what you're doing. What, what, are the, what is the good you're doing in the community? The big change is that we actually have that ability to, to do that right now. Case management is, is pretty much case management. How you're working with people, how you're creating those goals and achieving those goals is different when you start applying performance to it. And when you can show that performance, and when you can then wrap the AHAR and the APR around it, and then present that to the government, uh, you have a much more compelling story. Does that make sense to everyone, what, how that's going to make an impact? Uh, and then some of the changes, um, HUD hasn't released the requirements from HEARTH. They've, they've done homelessness, the, the definition, but they haven't yet said, here's the data quality that you have to get captured. Here are the elements that you now have to put on the reports. Here's the performance we want to see you gathering. Those things haven't been released yet, but they're supposed to come out sometime in 2012. And when that does happen, with ETO, you're on a SAS system, you're going to be ready to go. We're going to be able to make those changes, and you're going to see those changes happen, but very quickly you're going to be able to capture that data and be Hearth compliant right away. Okay, similar to HPRP, who went through the HPRP pain? So you know that that came out in June, and by August, they're like, okay, go ahead and report. And everybody's like, wait a minute, we can't report. You just gave us the standards a week ago. So when that happens, a lot of companies were really in bad shape. A lot of organizations that were working in, in homelessness were saying, well, I can't, I can't report on these. But you're going to be ready because you already have the system. Uh, the other thing is it's going to allow you to stay compliant. So with ETO and Hearth, it's really going to, they, they play together very, very nicely. Any questions on that piece? Okay. All right, I'm going to turn the mic back over to, to Jane.
Okay. This is really strange for me to wear a mic. I used to uh, teach in a county prison, and the first thing you learn to do um, in a, I don't know if anybody's ever worked in a county prison, but uh, the first thing you learn to do is project your voice because with all authority, because inmates will respond quickly usually to that and before you have to like take them down. And so being I was 5'4", I learned to project very quickly. So it's weird for me to have a mic on. So if I get too loud, just tell me because I'm so used to projecting. Okay, this is the fun part I really like. This is the roadmap. Um, we have been talking to clients, we have been talking as staff, we've been talking to HUD, um, trying to figure out what can we do to make HMIS less painful and easier to use and better quality for our users. So we have created a roadmap. Uh, we have already started on this roadmap. Um, it will go through 2011 and through the next year, we're going to be keep adding enhancements and changes that hopefully will make you be singing the ETO HMIS theme song by the end of the year. Um, the first thing I'm gonna talk about are the export files. For those of you who do have to export your files, um, currently we already support the CSV files. Um, we are going to also support um, the XML files as well. So that is coming, we will support XML export files. For data imports, we currently have an HMIS batch upload tool. I'm not sure if you all realize that, but we do have an HMIS batch upload tool. So when you upload into the HMIS, it auto, you take the files, the CSV files that you saw earlier, the, the participant program file, the client file, the um, benefit income, all the files, you upload them into ETO, it automatically creates the client, the demographics, the assessments, and the points of service. Um, what we are also going to be doing is we're going to add referrals um, and assets, uh, funds disbursements to that. Um, we also have a conversion tool. So if, if, a, if you ever needed to upload files in an XML format, we have a tool that will take those XML files, convert them into the CSV format so we can use the upload tool. Hmm. Oh no, that's okay, I'll do it. I have a control issue. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, the Arizona matrix, okay, we already talked about um, the HEARTH Act and how we're, HUD is going to move everybody into more performance uh, reporting. Um, the Arizona matrix is optional right now. If you um, have ever read the specs and the reporting specs for the CSV files and things like that, very interesting reading. Um, you will see there is an Arizona matrix. And in the Arizona matrix, um, it's all of the HUD services broken down into measurable areas. That is already an ETO. One of the things that we are trying to do now as we become a team around HMIS is to plan ahead so when things happen at HUD and they finally bring the requirements down, we're not scrambling with all the other vendors, we're already there. So what we're going to, we already have the matrix in. If you want the matrix, let us know. We'll help set you up on the matrix. Um, and now we are also going to produce that CSV outcomes file um, so that we're ready when they roll down the specs for the reporting, we'll be ready. We already have the data collected, we already have it formatted, and we'll be much faster on putting out that report. Um, yes? What kinds of outcomes does the matrix look uh, For example, uh, child care, um, Im they'll improve child care, um, and there's also definitions um, of what one means, two means, three means, all the levels, um, HUD has defined all that. Um, and then uh, transportation, um, finding a job, employment, uh, there's a list of I think 13 different sets of, of matrix measurements. And to further that answer, it's, it's designed to measure self-sufficiency. Yes. Are you able to go out into the world all by yourself? Correct. Um, so the data sync. Um, anybody here from Mass, Massachusetts? Okay, good. Oh, that's right. I asked that because I showed you my, my Buffalo Bills. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm sliding right over it. Um, 
we in Massachusetts, we, we are working with the state of Massachusetts. We have multi-continuums on one enterprise. And right now they're um, using it for the emergency assistance uh, programs. Um, but we're taking that concept of data, um, between sharing data between enterprises. Right now, you have an enterprise with sites and you can share data, but we haven't really shared data across enterprises. So uh, drum roll here, we're going to show you how this works. So you have the COC enterprise. Um, so maybe it's the state of Massachusetts, maybe it is um, uh, a different state, or maybe it's a COC that has multiple different you, um, um, uh, enterprises, or it could be simple as a COC as an enterprise and they're using ETO. But a program within the COC already has ETO. They already have their own system and they're already collecting data. Um, right now, instead of doing data in the two systems, we are going to have a link so you can, uh, the, the program can enter all of their their, their data into one system on their enterprise. So if they do programs outside of HMIS, great, wonderful. You can still record all your data. You can record your HMIS data into the template, which, which of course, you know, everybody is uh, using pretty much now. So once it's in the template, it will automatically, you won't have to do anything. You don't have to click a button, it's nothing. Um, it's gonna be programmed on the back end to ship that data to the enterprise in a read-only format so they can get all the reporting. And this will happen multiple, multiple times during the day. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm very excited about it as well. Yes, ma'am. I, I just want to mention that. Um, okay, so <laughs> I, I, my name is Sam. I work for the Willis Center in Worcester, Massachusetts. And so we have um, the CMHA, which is the Central Mass yes. uh, Housing uh -huh. Alliance. Patrick? At, yeah, Patrick. <laughs> Patrick Mahoney. Um, and so they're on ETO. The Willis Center has their own ETO that we track within our own program and our own com our own agency. We also have HMIS. And then there's that other um, you know, virtual gateway as well that we enter data for. So just to sort of use that as an example of how it's going to work here. So the COC ETO Enterprise, which is the first block on your screen, mm -hmm. that would look like CMHA. It, yes, that could be CMHA. That could be the state of Massachusetts. Right. Yeah. All right. And then um, you have Willis Center ETO. Willis right. Center ETO. So, um, and then we have HMIS. Right. So then we can just essentially go into one system, yes. enter data, then it will get migrated to CMHA and to HMIS. Uh, right now, I, they're testing it as a one-way to one. Um, I, Steve, you might have more of an idea on the roadmap if it will go to the COC and the state. Uh, that I'd have to get more clarification. But um, right now, what they're testing right now is a is a one-way. But I, you know, I mean, I'm not a developer like my friend Xander over here. Um, but if it seems to me, if you've figured out to go one way, you know, I would think. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, what I can speak to is it's very, very much our intention not to leave our, our customer base in a situation where they have to enter data into one instance of ETO and then enter into another instance of ETO. It's just that you know we, we, we believe we can do better than that for them. So there's there's this is part of that commitment. Um, this is the first step in, in getting these uh, the one way sync to the COC. But I think you'll see further right. iteration. So, um, so what I brought up today, you know, we're we're working towards. We're in the first steps, but we can certainly yes. work towards. And the conversations are being had to ensure that we're not doing three times of the data Correct. entry. E Willis Center ETO, CMHA, HMIS, and then virtual gateway essentially. But Correct. So, we're we're working. I'm so happy. I, I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy too. I mean, I think this is a really a, a great step. Um, so we also have, in addition to the HMIS variables in our uh, site ETO database, um, a lot of our own variables. Mm -hmm. And so is, that's not going to cause a problem, right? No. It will only take, it will take the elements that are part of the ETO HMIS template. Those are the elements it will take. And it will it will ship. Multiple sites they have to report to the state and the state like the one ETO. And they enter into files that will automatically upload into the state so they no longer have to do a C D a C F D file. Right. They they would that will be uh, where are you? Okay, yeah. Oh yeah, 
Oh, Springfield. Okay, yeah, I know you. All right. Well, you know, it's so nice. I get to put faces and names and everything together. So, yes. Um, it, and right now, let me tell you where we're at right now. Right now in Massachusetts, we are doing um, the, the uh, pilot. So we're piloting it right now um, with the state of Mass. And then once the pilot's done, I would assume, um, in, in, how many of you got the first HMIS, HMIS newsletter? If you did not get the newsletter, um, Tony, stand up and let me see you. See Tony afterwards <laughs> and get on the mailing list for the, we're, we have, uh, we're going to be sending out quarterly newsletters. We're going to give you updates of everything that's going to change. Um, anything that comes down from HUD, we think you should know. We're going to try to really increase our communication. So, um, we will, we will keep everybody abreast of where the pilot is, how it's going, and, and when we will be able to move into other implementations of that. Yes? So this is not necessarily a question to the HMIS system. Are you looking at multiple maps relative to all the states? I'm from Maryland. Mm -hmm. all, our, our, main, our main funder is the uh, Department of Mental Health and Hygiene. And so all the states have started to look at their own web-based systems and collect the data and outcomes. Are you looking at the same type of process that we're doing here relative to those other state systems that, are, that each state's created? So, for example, let me see if I have you correct. So, um, I, you mean if, that we could send data to another vendor? Yeah, like for instance, this is, this is I assume, I'm speculating here, that you have these provider-based agencies sending information to HUD. Mm -hmm. the federal government to, to, to eliminate duplication of information, that's why you're saying. Right, as long as they're on ETO, we can do this data. Tra but what we can do is, um, if for the imports, like right now I have some clients in New York. Is anybody here from New York? Okay, foothold? Uh, okay, so um, they, what they do is uh, their COC has a vendor that's a different vendor. Um, but they have per people who, um, report to that COC that use ETO. So we produce the CSV files, they zip them, uh, bring, you know, download them, zip them, which um, also I'm, we're trying to automate that a little more as well for you guys. Um, so uh, then they send it to Foothold and they upload it. Um, that, that's why, it, you know, they have a process. I can't remember what Foothold calls theirs, but it, it, it's a special program they use. Um, and then they upload the data into their system. So right now, that's how vendors are working together, is through the CSV and the XML files. But you're talking a non-HUD system, right? Yeah. Oh, non-HUD. Yeah, what, uh, what I'm looking at is that this is obviously, uh, we, we, don't, we don't use this system. We don't use any of oh. We have, I don't have anything. So this is non-HMIS programs. Can we do this with non-HMIS programs? This seems like the same process in the sense of you basically took a template. And you're you're mm -hmm. looking at here's, here's the functionality, here's the data sets that HIMS needs, and you're basically applying, here's the template, so I enter it in once, and here's your information that goes through multiple vectors. And it's the same thing. It's like when you're thinking about your roadmaps, I know this is your first roadmap, right. but don't forget Non-HMIS so programs. Department of Human Resources, you're creating your own system. So what? The okay. HMH or whatever they're calling in each state for, you know, uh, are creating your own system. And what's happening is, is there's no communication between the state, the federal government, and the providers relative to this data migration. And then you're going you're gonna to have the state, you know, local provider, mm -hmm. collecting their information. And you have the state. So it's more about, instead of every one of us having to build those bridges yeah. that cost, you know, yeah. Significant amount of money, et cetera, et cetera. That this template, when you're talking about data migration, would be. Yeah, I'm not saying this is part of this. Matter. Oh no, I yeah. Like, Patrick, to to the key. I'll be honest with you, the key to that is a little bit of, I, I think social solutions can be helpful in presenting the case when these when the states go out. I mean, obviously, hey look, we're gonna try to sell the state, right? Right. That, that, that's that's where I actually see it's the, the market. So I certainly hope to get there with you. But short of that goal, um, Hearing your voice at DHR when they're looking at um, redoing the system and standing uh, standing up to them and saying, look, okay, at the very least, take an XML import or take a CSV import. We're providers. Here's the good data we collect now, and we don't want to stop doing this. I mean, you, you can have somewhat of a voice, and we can help out in that process a bit. Um, making sure these systems take information and, and are able to import information is pretty critical. Otherwise, everyone's going to end up doing double data entry. 
or triple or quadruple, right. mm -hmm. depending on how many systems they have. Uh, barcode scanning. Um, is anybody using barcode scanning in here now for HMIS? Okay. Um, <laughs> he's got his own card now. <laughs> um, we currently do support barcode scanning. Um, we, you can scan people in and out, like if you're using um, a program start date and program end date um, as, as your uh, dates of, of being um, housed. You can scan people in and scan people out as far as coming in every day, if you want to keep their attendance to make sure they're there every day and things like that. Um, but what we're trying to do and what we're moving towards doing is increasing uh, the process and the speed of that because a lot of times emergency shelters like to do scanning is what we've been finding. And um, I know we're working with Texas right now on that. Um, and they have, I believe, four emergency shelters that will be barcode scanning. And so uh, we're trying to make it faster and easier uh, for the HMIS clients that choose to do the barcode scanning. So that is also coming down the pike. Um, enhanced navigation for families. Um, how many of, of, of you using ETO right now use the participant dashboard? I love, the, I love, I love the dashboard. Um, and I love it even more now that referrals are on it. Um, we are creating an HMIS family dashboard. So it'll be easier for you to work and follow your clients. We're going to increase or improve, I'm sorry, improve the workflow navigation for HMIS. Um, we are going to, uh, for those of you who have our COCs and you're enrolling um, you know, across the enterprises, we are going to have an enterprise enroll for family. Right now, you have to do it by person. Um, so we're going to have family name as part of that as well. So those are coming down the pike. Uh, data quality. Data quality, in my opinion, and I, and I have to admit, I've only been working with HMIS since March. Um, but I have now experienced many sleepless nights that you have now done because I understand it at more. Um, data quality is essential. Your funding is associated with data quality. And if we do not step up and help you with that data quality, because there's masses amounts of data, then we would not be doing our job. So we are going to do, we're going to improve data error controls. So to give you some examples on this, um, if, if you try to dismiss a client, uh, oh, thank you. All right, at the end, we're all going to do the happy dance. All right. Um, it, so now it's okay I'm a Bills fan? <laughs> Good. Um, if, 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 if a client tries, to, if you try to dismiss a client before they leave the program, it's going to pop up a message saying you need to do the exit assessment. Another one is if you um, don't put in an age but you, or a birth date, but you say this is in for the data quality, it's a full date of birth, it's going to pop up a message. So we're going to find those um, consistent places in HMIS that people you have the most problems with and we are going to create those messages for you to help you monitor your data. Uh, the second one is we have um, you know some reports, the missing universal element report, so we have some reports that you can run for your data quality, they will be more. So we're going to do more reports to help you manage the data. Uh, HMIS reporting. Um, if anybody was in the ETO results training, um, you heard Abby talk about the scheduling. You will be able to do that with the HMIS reports as well, and that will save uh, the APR, the QP, whatever, it, whatever you want to run, it will save it for you uh, with that data set already in there. Uh, you know, I, you know, I have to. Okay, I, I, I can. I work in Webby. I was trained in Webby, um, and, and I know what can be painful. And, and my buddy Xander and I, I, I told him I want to be the best man when he gets married because we're going to be connected to the hip. Um, we are going to be working on formatting, absolutely, 100%, because it's painful for me too. <laughs> so what's really nice is I'm running so many reports for you all, I really am learning the pain points. So um, when I feel pain, Xander feels my pain, so. 
Um, uh, of course, I already mentioned the data quality reports. Um, the uploading, uh, when, when HUD rolls out enhancements, like you know they did in 2010 at the end, the big data standard changes, the report changes, uh, it was a huge, huge change. And that was painful, it, it was painful. Um, so what we are going to do, we are going, because now we're using the template it, it's easier to manage and control. Um, we're lock, we've locked down some things that people aren't always happy with, but we have to control the data quality. We must control the data quality. For example, if you add a gazillion questions to the AP or to the uh, assessments, and you add a, tons of conditional elements in, it will break. It will break because you're overloading it. And if we mo roll out new assessments from you know that HUD made changes to. It's not going to pre-populate, and we will not bring your data into it, that you created your own elements. Um, we really are trying to uh, keep HMIS, HMIS. Um, and that way, the reporting will smooth as cake, OK? It, it, so that's why we are doing some of the changes that we're doing. Yes? Um, so is it your suggestion that people don't add questions into the HUD, but maybe create their own assessment with those questions? Yes, absolutely. Uh, if everybody did that, I would probably be the happiest little redhead on this planet. Um, so the other thing that we did last time is, yes, ma'am. I just want to uh, piggyback on that one, because uh, do you have an idea of when that's going to happen, or when that's going to be? Uh, I, they, HUD hasn't put out the new requirements yet, so we're not sure what's going to change. We currently use our HMIS assessment for all of our programs, GEP, economic mobility, women to women mm -hmm. classes, healthy families, and that's why we have you know, probably 200 conditional statements that don't have a whole lot to do with HUD yeah. or HMIS, um, and also the three data points plus children, you know, there's six data points, child and adult and entry, annual and exit. So are we going to have to, so we're going to have to separate all of that my, out? My, yeah, my recommendation would be you make a copy, rename it something different for those non-HUD programs you want to use it for, right. um, and then you can do what you want to that one, but keep the HUD one set in, in what it is. Uh, when are the, when's this rolling down? When do you think we need to do this? I, I, I really don't have a time frame because I just, we, we have to see. Tomorrow? No, 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 no. But, but the other thing I want to say is, you know, as soon as HUD rolls out the changes or we get them, you know, we will communicate with you to let you know these have come down and these are the changes. I, you know, I don't want you to be shocked and, you know, all of a sudden it, we've updated your template. And then have you go in and say, oh my God, you know, we don't want that. So we will communicate so that you know what's coming and how it's coming. The other thing is, uh, this last time, I know that you had to email in and tell Brian when you were ready. This time we will, we will just do a massive rollout. Uh, it, so we are coming up, um, Adam and our development team, um, the brilliant, brilliant minds that they are, are coming up with a way that that will just roll out to everybody so you won't have to email in and request it, and yes, ma'am. So, okay, so then uh, we're going to have basically two separate assessments for intake and three. three. There'll be three assessments. Right, um, for all of our programs. So the next site-wide reporting is going to become kind of a problem. Uh, the only other choice you have is to use different, uh, to, to create a different assessment for the other programs. The, the problem is with HUD, if you, I've, and I've actually been through this, it's painful for customers. They've added too many questions and conditional elements, and they're getting script errors, and the data's not flowing. I'm one of those people. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, that's, and I just migrated um, one client, all of their data into our assessments um, so that it will f it flow better for them. I mean, it, it just was a nightmare. Um, in some of the conditional elements, you know, if they had a lot of defaults in, so, um, if this answer, then here. Well, we found out when we were going through all their data in, in their 150 conditional elements that those broke. And so it wasn't even getting to the export column, which we pull the data from, um, because it was breaking too much. So, uh, and it breaks when there's conflict. So you might not realize there's a conflict in the data 
um, in the conditional elements. But if there is a, and if a conflict exists, or if you have too many rules, contradictory rules under one. I spent a lot of time with um, yeah. staff last week. Right, right. right. So, so, I mean, there's just a lot of issues. So that's why um, my recommendation for less pain in your life is to leave HMIS as HMIS and then, and then do something, you know, create whatever you want for the other programs um, just because it will, it will make your HMIS reporting so much less painful. This isn't a, this isn't like one, this, this happens everywhere. Um, you're not the only agency that sure. runs into this. Right. Um, and, and some of the, the best practices across the industry is to put HUD as a separate as a separate piece. So when you do your intake, you're probably doing a large intake assessment. Right. Um, a, one single point of entry. And and that really is is a way that was kind of popular a couple of years ago, and it makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways because you do one, one assessment. The, the, the way to do that that may be a little easier and maybe a little more effective is to put those assessments in a, into a workflow so that you're grabbing them as you need them as opposed to putting them all up under one assessment. And that actually could be part of our navigation tools. I mean, we're trying to improve the HMIS navigation. So as we're looking at that, maybe we can come up with a workflow that can take you from assessment to assessment to assessment that you, know, you choose which assessment next. I don't know. I mean, it's something we'd have to look at. But I mean, as we improve the navigation, maybe that would, would assist. Yes? Um, one of the things that really helped us a lot, um, what we were facing like doing an intake assessment and uh, having lots of questions and things like that is that a lot of the um, demographic information, we just had it pre-populate over. So yes. those other questions, we, they could skip through because it's already answered mm -hmm. and just answer those other questions and stuff. So that sort of saves for some time as well. We need to do totally separate issues. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe maybe I can work with you more. I've done some, I know, but maybe we can work a little more. And 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 trust me when I tell you this. Uh, hopefully, you know, when HUD puts out those new requirements, um, I really want to let you guys know right away so we can start preparing for that. So, I honestly like the idea of going this way. I just yeah. Don't I, we just got to figure out how to help you get there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to go through. Right. And it'll be my job to help you do that. Thank you. Um, oh, and this is the last slide, but I'm really excited about this one as well. We are going to have a new HMIS service offering. Uh, there's many people that just don't have the time to do the data quality um, checks on, on their enterprise or their systems. And we will actually um, have a service offering. I don't have the details of, of the cost of that, but we will run your reports monthly, your, all your data quality reports. And um, then we will work uh, with the administrator to um, so help them know what uh, needs to be fixed in the system for data quality. So uh, that's something that's also coming down the pike. So uh, I think that pretty much wraps up um, HMIS. Do we have any questions? Uh, if, throw them on out there. <laughs> How can I make ESG easier? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, 
we can talk about that because I have some thoughts on, you know, maybe that's something that, again, that we can look at when we're, well, <laughs> yeah, the assessments it will always be an issue. That's always going to be an issue. Um, actually, okay, here's one thing we're doing, um, and I forgot to put this in there, shame on me. Um, not everybody needs to do the big long assessment. You know, there's some programs that can get away with a shorter version, and we are going to be putting that into ETO as well. So that may be a solution there. Yeah, um, actually, Taylor, do you guys, oh, that's another member of our team, Taylor Henderson. Um, Taylor is a project manager. Um, he and I right now are implementing all the COCs together. I'm doing the single programs that come in. Um, but, but he's also a member of our team, and he and I are working together on that assessment. So, so that might help you there. Yeah, yeah, I'll let you know ASAP. Um, any other questions? Somewhere else. Somebody else was going to ask a question. He must have felt the vibe. Good job. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.